Well, we are going to move the show forward here, going to turn our attention to Palestine, and we are very honored to be joined here by Ali Abu Nima, who's the director of the Electronic Intifada, also the author of The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Ali, thanks so much for being back with us. Thank you so much. Well, Amnesty International released a report uh, saying that there is apartheid in Israel. I, I think a lot of people saying, you know, thanks for catching up. But nevertheless, it's a big name, Amnesty <laughs> International. So how do you rank the importance of this report? And uh, well, I'll leave it there. Well, uh, on hi, Rania, too. It's nice to nice to Hello. nice to see you again so soon. Um, well, it's it's. Uh, I think one way we can judge it is by Israel's reaction, and Israel is pissed. Mm. They are really, really pissed. And I think understandably so, because um, apartheid is uh, defined in international law as a crime against humanity, and it is up there alongside genocide as one of the worst things you can do. And, of course, apartheid uh, is um, the... Uh, Oppression, racial oppression, systematic racial oppression of one group over another, something that shouldn't exist in the 21st century, especially not in a country alleging that it's a democracy, let alone the only democracy in the region, when in reality it is committing this uh, crime against humanity of racial uh, oppression and persecution. Um, and Israel is really pissed because Amnesty International is the biggest human rights group in the world. It is not just, uh, you know, Amnesty is not just saying, okay, we have done a report and we're putting it out there and you can read it or you can put it up on the bookshelf or whatever you want to do. Amnesty is saying we are launching a global campaign against Israeli apartheid. And this is an organization with uh, chapters in dozens of countries and which, uh, you know, love it or hate it, has been a very effective campaigning organization uh, over many decades. So it really mainstreams the, uh, the, the fight to end Israeli apartheid in a way that even, you know, this, this amnesty report comes uh, almost exactly a year after B'Tselem, a leading Israeli human rights group, issued a similar report, and then last April, Human Rights Watch did the same, and then now uh, we have Amnesty coming out. So it's also, it's not just that Amnesty is the biggest organization, the best known global organization to do this, it's the accumulation, it's that, you know, the most mainstream and respected uh, human rights organizations can no longer avoid the conclusion of, of the reality that Palestinians themselves, of course, uh, have been describing accurately for, for many decades. You know, Ali, I saw um, that there was, was it the Amnesty branch, you can correct me here, the Amnesty branch in Germany uh, distanced themselves from mm. this report, which I found very interesting. And you have been somebody who's been very outspoken about the way that Germany deals with the issue of Israel, uh, which is a very special way, particularly compared with its historical responsibility for what's happening to Palestinians, as well as the way it behaves in comparison to either uh, even other Western countries. It's just like unconditionally Israel can do no wrong. So can you talk a little bit about what happened with the amnesty branch in mm. Germany and give us your thoughts on why the Germans behave this way when it comes to Israel and why it's even more morally reprehensible. Right. So the, uh, um, the German chapter of amnesty said that they're not going to uh, promote this report or organize any events around it, uh, which is of course disgraceful. And I, I, I think amnesty's international uh, governing body should consider whether the, the German chapter should not be sanctioned for its refusal to advocate for universal human rights, because the whole idea of human rights is they should be universal. And here's the uh, German chapter of Amnesty saying that Palestinians should be singled out uh, to not deserve uh, full and equal human rights. And that's utterly disgraceful. But that fits into the bigger context of the way uh, Germany 
uh, has failed to deal with its history uh, of, Ge you know, the German state murdered millions of Jewish people just for being Jews. And instead of dealing with that, they've tried to externalize and export their guilt by um, supporting the unconditional persecution of the Palestinian people by the Israeli state. And this is supposedly uh, in order to show that, oh, Germany has learned the lessons of history, but it shows that they've learned nothing at all. Because first of all, equating the actions of the state of Israel with all Jews is reprehensible, is anti-Semitic. But that's what Germany is saying when they say that if you criticize Israel, that makes you against Jews. They're saying that Israel and the Jewish people all over the world are the same thing. And that's utterly deplorable. So basically, P Palestinians are being made to pay for uh, the European genocide of European Christian Jews. And it's absolutely disgraceful. And it, it shows that Germany, along with other European states and, of course, the United States uh, in the lead, is completely complicit with this uh, brutal and barbaric system of Israeli racial oppression and apartheid. I mean, you know, I also saw, oh, no, <laughs> we, all, we can do this at least at least once or twice throughout the show when we're not in the same place. It's got to happen. Please go ahead, Eugene. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, I was just glad you brought up the issue of the complicity of the EU countries because, I mean, I wonder how you evaluate what we saw with all those EU envoys going out to Sheikh Jarrah. I think they went out there and a few others. It was just the strangest thing. All of a sudden in my feed, I see like all these you know, European diplomats out there decrying, uh, you know, the, the the growth of settlements, which, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy to decry it, but it just seemed almost uh, cruel the way they were doing it yeah. as if, like, they were just sort of innocent bystanders. It's disgusting. I find it deplorable. You know, they, they go out and they do these uh, photo ops with uh, Palestinian families whose homes are about to be demolished by Israel. And they say, oh, you know, look at, look at these poor Palestinians, and here we are to show our solidarity with them. Well, their governments are the ones arming and funding Israel to commit these crimes. Their governments are the ones who are uh, using every possible international forum to block accountability for Israel. The German government, uh, along with other European governments, um, issued, uh, you know, briefs in the International Criminal Court to oppose an investigation of war crimes in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. All of these European countries in the United States are opposing uh, uh, investigations by the Human Rights Council. So it's really cruel. It's cynical. It's, I, I would say, sociopathic uh, to, um, to uh, go and pretend to show sympathy with people while you're aiding and abetting the people who are killing them. We have a saying in Arabic uh, about uh, the person who uh, uh, murders the victim and then walks in his funeral. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what, uh, what uh, these European states are doing. They participate in the oppression, the murder, the expulsion, the dispossession, the persecution of Palestinians in, in material ways. Israel couldn't literally couldn't do it without them, and they then they come the then they throw a pity party to say oh these poor Palestinians oh and we're funding uh, schools for them and we're funding you know Israel demolishes the schools that the European Union builds. Israel has demolished many schools built by the European Union. What does the European Union do? Do they sanction Israel? Do they punish Israel? Do they hold it accountable? No, they, they give it more support. And on the same day that Amnesty issued its uh, report on Israeli apartheid, the European Union announced $700 million to fund uh, a link to link Israel's electricity grid with the European Union. And one of the um, uh, consequences of this will be that the European Union is providing Israeli settlements in occupied Palestinian land with European electricity. So that, that, 
you know, that's just one example of, of many, but the, the guns, the bombs, the bulldozers, the, the, the bullets, the, the tear gas, the weapons they use to commit the crime of apartheid uh, are all thanks to the United States, Canada, and the European Union primarily. You know, it's it's so interesting how you just frame that because I can think of so many people who've worked in, whether from the U.S. side, have worked in like the uh, consulate in Jerusalem, and the same goes for members of the EU and various European countries. Once they've spent time there as individuals, they are very well aware of the fact that this is like a disgusting system that they're witnessing and that it's apartheid and it's horrible they won't say it publicly because their country they're there to serve their country's agenda and foreign policy and i just want to bring it to that for a moment because i think it's important to remember that this isn't just an issue of israel's being mean and committing human rights violations and if we could just stop that everything would be fine it, everything would be better if they would stop doing that but it serves a bigger purpose Right. There's a reason that the EU and the US and the, in Canada give Israel this unconditional aid and are constantly defending Israel. Can you talk a little bit about what the purpose of Israel is for Western hegemony in the Middle East? Because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, that that's sort of you open. I mean, that that that's such a big discussion. And so, it's so many question. direct. Yeah, it's a big question. But I mean, one thing that came to mind as you were speaking is like, well, what's the purpose of Canada? What's the purpose of the United States? <laughs> right. Why should why should any of them uh, exist? And uh, rather, I think the question is, how and why do they exist? These are all settler colonies that are founded on uh, mm -hmm. genocide, slavery, and uh, uh, racial oppression that, that still exists. I, I have right behind me what for me was a seminal book of understanding how it still exists is is the the, the new Jim Crow. So mm -hmm. you know this is this Israel is part of this system. So you know for them Israel should exist the same way Canada should exist. They don't question it because they are they are all part of the same uh, uh, system and mindset and, and ideology. So that, that's sort of the biggest picture uh, response I can give. But of course, Israel is part of, you know, Israel is a client of the United States and the U.S. empire. And that is very well illustrated by what's happening even today, where the Israeli so-called defense minister, the Israeli war minister, Benny Gantz, a man with the blood of thousands of Palestinians on his hand, including on his hands, including hundreds and hundreds of children who he murdered in Gaza, both as the Israeli army chief and as the defense minister, is in Bahrain today, another American client state. And, you know, he'll, mm -hmm. and this comes after, uh, you know, the Israeli president was in uh, the United Arab Emirates the other day. These, these countries are all bases of U.S. imperialism. Bahrain is the home of the American Sixth Fleet, um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, of course. These are all U.S. client regimes, and, and Israel is another U.S. client regime. And uh, so they they function the same way Iran functioned under the Shah before the revolution, uh, which is to uh, help bolster uh, U.S. hegemony, which, of course, now is, is fraying and crumbling and creaking on its pillars uh, like... Uh, like we haven't seen before, as um, you know, as particularly China uh, 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 becomes a rising global uh, economic and political power. One interesting thing in this regard is that, as Israel has found it harder to um, to sort of get big uh, Western companies to come in and build its settler colonial infrastructure because boycott campaigns have successfully driven a number of major infrastructure companies out of Israel, like Veolia, that's a big international for firm, was forced out by uh, boycott campaigns. Israel has increasingly turned to Chinese firms for uh, major infrastructure. Um, 
And uh, the United States, because it, it views China as a rival, has actually forced Israel to curtail its dealings with China and to actually clear all of its uh, major deals with China through the U.S. State Department before doing so. So that, that illustrates, again, how the U.S. sees Israel as, hey, you're in our camp, you're our base, you're our son of a bitch, to borrow a, 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 a <laughs> phrase, and so therefore you will do as, as we tell you. Ronya, I was just giving you a chance. Now. I, just I know, I was, I, I was I, I giving, thought, I you know. was we. <laughs> I was like, who's going to, are we going to enter? Are we going to do it? Or are we going to talk at the same time? <laughs> are we? No, I'm waiting for you. Did you want to know? Okay. okay, it's me. All right, cool. Ali, we have I can just keep just talking, but I wanted <laughs> to give you, <laughs> you guys a chance. It's your show. You know I happens? wanted to give you a chance. We, <laughs> me and Eugene, you, me and Eugene usually have a good rhythm, but then we did one in-person show where we were sitting next to each other. And I think that has disrupted our ability to not jump in at the same time. So last week we had a few kerfuffles where we both jumped into the same time. But no, I mean, I think that's such an excellent point, point. And I actually recently had you on and we talked quite a bit. If people want to hear more of what Ali thinks about uh, the coming multipolar world and what it means to Palestine. I highly recommend you after this show, go check out the interview we did at the beginning of the year. But, you know, I did notice one thing that Amnesty did. Of course, it's good that Amnesty came out and did this report. You know, we're all kind of like Eugene said at the beginning, really? I mean, it's been, it's Took you this long. Yeah. It, yeah. It took you this long, but okay, great. Like this report's out. It does mean something. It is important. But at the same time, they did a weird thread about, uh, about the issue of apartheid and what's happening in Palestine. And there was one tweet in particular where Amnesty said, we don't take a position on the occupation. And yeah. I know they got beat up a lot on Twitter over that. I'm curious your thoughts on that, because that seemed a bit odd to me that they would yeah. come and nobody asked them to, but they came out and said, we don't take a position on the occupation. And I feel like yeah. it kind of says something about the limits of the human rights paradigm when it comes to this issue of settler colonialism and ethnic cleansing and land theft. But please go ahead. Absolutely, it does. But uh, my understanding that uh, tweet thread, the uh, including a ridiculous tweet, I, I think I have it here, uh, where they say, "Yeah, they kind of do this 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 thread." I'm very old fashioned. I actually printed I printed the tweet out. <laughs> Who does that? Uh, so does does Amnesty oppose Israel's military occupation of Palestine? Amnesty hasn't taken a position on occupation. Our focus has been on the Israeli government's obligations as the occupying power under international law. But Amnesty has taken no position on the occupation itself. That's a really weird tweet. But an interesting thing to notice is that it comes from Amnesty International USA. Mm. Remember that Amnesty is not a U.S.-based organization. It's a, it's a U.K.-based organization. It was founded in the U.K. So Amnesty International USA is one of its chapters. And so uh, it, I interpret that as sort of the American branch, which is more sort of defensive and uh, susceptible to the uh, American taboo on criticizing Israel, kind of trying to like uh, cover its ass by saying, hey, look, you know, look, look how unbiased we are. We don't even condemn the occupation. So to me, it's a signal of, of how even now there's still a lot of fear around uh, uh, having this discussion. Uh, and so in a sense, you could say it's, it's, it's a bit like how the German uh, chapter of Amnesty um, dissociated itself from from the report, but the report is there and it's endorsed by, you know, it is in Amnesty's name. That said, you're right, Rania, that it still uh, uh, exists within the framework of, you know, liberal human rights discourse. Nonetheless, it does go a lot further than ever before. And I think Amnesty, to its credit, uh, defines the states that the um, Israeli system of apartheid was established in 1948 at the same time that Israel was established. In other words, it, 
I think it's it, it goes further than we've seen many liberal groups go before, which often tried to say, oh, well, you know, everything was fine before 1967. But then in right. 1967, when Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza, you know, Israel lost its soul. But before mm. that, it was this beautiful <laughs> kumbaya, beautiful thing. It's only in 1967 that Israel lost its way and we're worried about its soul. To its credit, the amnesty report really goes back to 1948 and, and, and really says that from the beginning, this was a system of apartheid. But as my colleague uh, Maureen Murphy at the Electronic Intifada wrote in an excellent article we published today, uh, she points out that, you know, for all the uh, uh, good analysis in the amnesty report, it really falls short on uh, understanding that uh, all of this is happening within the context of settler colonialism. And that's fundamental. Mm -hmm. The goal of Zionism and the goal of the settlers who came from Europe was not to come and establish an apartheid regime. Their goal was to take the land from the Palestinians and get rid of the Palestinians. The, the fact that there is an apartheid regime is a consequence of the fact that Israel failed to get rid of all the Palestinians and therefore, from its perspective, was forced to rule them by apartheid. But Israel's preference is to get rid of the Palestinians altogether. And so settler colonialism is, if we take it to its logical end, is, uh, is actually a genocidal ideology. And I didn't catch all of the uh, prior discussion uh, regarding uh, Leonard, Leonard Peltier, but that that you know that's an exact parallel the the the, the uh, us the, the europeans who came to the united states didn't come with the goal of dominating uh, native people in this country they came with the goal of taking the land and if that meant exterminating them they were fine with that if that meant ruling them through cruel oppression or putting them in re in reservations that's what they do but the ultimate goal was to take the land and that is the goal of Zionism, and that is the goal of Israel today. And in a sense, from Israel's perspective, apartheid is a temporary measure until they can get rid of the Palestinians altogether, one way or the other, and take the land. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, very important distinctions, and I think very notable to see how the tide just continues to rise against Israeli apartheid. And certainly I do hope people check out Maureen's article and follow the Electronic Intifada all the time, every day. Really appreciate your work and everyone there, Ali, and thanks again for joining us here on the Freedom Side. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.